Hello and welcome to BTN's Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Root of BTN.com. We're back with a brand new episode here on the Take 10 Podcast, and uh, it's a really good one, in my humble opinion. i uh, got a, another really great guest on the show today, and it's a guest that Big Ten basketball fans uh, in the last decade or so will almost certainly remember um, his name. It's former Minnesota basketball star Trevor Mbakwe. Uh, he was one of those guys that seemed like he was uh, around forever. I think he got five or six years on the uh, Gopher campus, and we talked to him about it here in just a moment, and he'll, he'll run through it. But one of those guys, uh, you know, like a Robbie Hummel or uh, a Greg Paulus, if you're thinking Duke, who was just on campus forever, and uh, he made an impact in Minnesota on some of Minnesota's better teams of this decade. So talk a lot of uh, Gopher basketball with Trevor Mbakwe. We also talk about his overseas uh, pro career. He's currently playing in Japan. So we got a hold of him, uh, despite the 15-hour time difference, which was uh, which was interesting. But got it done, and uh, like I said, great discussion with with Trevor coming up that you want to get to. We also have an interview with our producer Colleen Degnan, like we've done the last uh, five or six episodes, where we've kicked off a still re- relatively new segment called Call for the Culture, where Colleen gets us up to speed in the intersection of pop culture, sports music, entertainment, and whatever else uh, pops into our millennial minds. So that's always fun with her. Um, that follows the interview with Trevor and Bakwe, and we'll get right to first Trevor and then uh, Colleen here in just a moment. First, quick reminder that you can subscribe to Take 10 Podcast if you don't already on our uh, multiple platforms that it's available, including Podbean for Android. Uh, I'm an Android user, so I gotta give that plug. Google Play as well, and of course Apple Podcasts for all you iPhone and Apple users out there. So if you're streaming, head on over to those platforms and subscribe. All right, without any further delay, let's get to our first interview of the episode. Like I said, it's former Minnesota basketball star Trevor Mbakwe, and that interview starts right now. Very pleased to be joined by a former basketball star in Minnesota. He's currently playing basketball professionally in Japan. It's Trevor Mbakwe. Trevor, man, what's up? How's it going? I'm good, Alex. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, we're doing it over Skype because, like I said, you're all the way in Japan, quite a long way from home. Uh, right now it's Monday morning there, Sunday evening here. So first off, how uh, annoying is it to try and stay in touch with everyone and everything going back on back home with uh, that window? Uh, it's tough, you know, especially now. Usually, I'm in Europe, so the time difference is only like seven, eight hours. But, you know, in Japan, it's 15 hours. So, you know, it's <laughs> it's completely different. Like you said, it's nighttime there, and I'm just waking up here in Japan. So it's it has its tough days, but, you know, you make it work. You're the only, uh, maybe one of the only people to be watching the Oscars on a, on a Monday, if you tune into that right now. <laughs> so how did, uh, uh, how did a deal uh, in Japan come about? How did you uh, get to hooping that far from home? Uh, yeah, this is my first year hooping in, or playing in Asia, actually. Uh, I, my agent has kind of brought it up to me. It's something I never really thought about us playing outside of Europe. But um, I, I know I had a, former, a lot of former teammates who came over here and spoke highly of the league. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's upcoming and it's a pretty solid league and a great country. And, you know, I just felt I need a need a change of pace for once, you know, kind of get away from Europe for a little bit. And so far, it's been great. I'm in Osaka, which is one of the largest cities in Japan. And, you know, it's been everything I've imagined it to be. It's been everything you imagine it to be, but I noticed you tweeted recently that you keep hitting your head in Japan. Like, what's the deal with that, man? What's going on? Man, yeah, the ceilings here. I just can't figure it out. The trains in my apartment, just every day I'm hitting my head on my uh, on something, and my kids look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> like, how does it keep happening? You so, know, I guess, uh, huh? Go ahead. No, I'm saying, I guess uh, I'm a little bit taller than the average uh, Asian, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, what's it like being an American basketball player in Japan? Because not only are your kids looking at you like you're crazy, but I'm sure you stand out quite a bit just walking down the street. What's that uh, experience like? Yeah, stand out a little bit, especially when walking with my teammates. You know, we kind of get stares and everything. and every, You know, but they're all great. And, you know, they, they like the, uh, basketball. It's kind of big over here, so it's all fun. Um, you know, I don't feel any type of way that I feel anywhere else. But you definitely get a little bit more looks here and a little bit more, you know, like <laughs> – glazy eyes wonder who we are and you know if we're professional actually like nba players or something so it's, so it's pretty funny 
what do you think the biggest culture shock has been uh, playing in Asia? Um, maybe the food. I've been visited a few times. Me and my wife and family have been in the grocery store and not really know what we're looking at, you know, as far as meats and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, just or just being in Tokyo and seeing all the bright lights and stuff like that, it's kind of just, it's hit us a few times. Like, wow, we're, we're in Japan, you know, versus like, you know, a lot of player, our places in Europe are kind of westernized. So it kind of looks kind of similar to place some places in the States. So, but here, you know, you don't really feel that too often. So it's kind of cool to actually feel, you know, like you're in a different place. I'm curious, like Japan's so small geographically. How do you guys get around the games? Is it like trains, buses, cars? Yeah. It's the first time that, yeah, we don't have cars here. So we, we get picked up for practicing games from our team manager. And then everywhere else, we have to take the train. So we're, we're, we're locals when it comes to that. We have to figure out the train stations or the train uh, schedules and everything. So that's been kind of unique and fun and interesting. Been lost a what? couple of times for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's big. Osaka is a little different than even Minneapolis, which is a nice yeah. to say here. Um, one other thing I noticed when scrolling through your, your Twitter timeline, I'm loving the, the tweets from fans who are obviously Japanese but are trying to tweet you in English. Uh, just reading off a couple examples here. You are the hero of rebounds. Uh, thank you for winning. Just some, some great examples of uh, the support they're trying to show. And props to them for, uh, for trying to – I don't know if they're hitting Google Translate or what. Oh, yeah, the, the trans, translation is always funny because, you know, sometimes it'll add up both ways. So, like, I might translate something to them. And they're like, what are you even saying to me? But it's cool. Yeah, the fans here are great. The people of the culture here are just awesome. You know, everybody's nice, helpful. But, yeah, the sometimes trying to uh, encrypt some of the messages or decrypt some of these messages are pretty uh, interesting at times. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, you're pretty much all the way across the world now. And it's been, uh, you know, looking back, like, five or six years since you left Minnesota. Take us through your stops since uh, since you left the Twin Cities. How many countries have you played in? It looks like you've been uh, quite a few places in Europe, like you said. Uh, if you could, just, just take, through, take us through all the stops since uh, your college career. Yeah, uh, this is my sixth season now. Um, yeah, I've been all over. First year, I've been in Italy twice, St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, um, Spain for a little bit, Germany, Germany before uh, twice, and uh, yes, yeah, I've been in some great cities. Been very fortunate to be live in some of the most beautiful cities in Europe and, and Asia. So I've been very lucky. And, uh, um, sorry, I <laughs> still early here, but um, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so yeah, uh, Tel Aviv, Saint Petersburg, uh, which was interesting. The city itself is beautiful, but the living there was probably the hardest that we've had to deal with. As you know, just as far as. Not many people speak English there. Um, you know, it's pretty dark this year round. So it was kind of hard, you know, getting the kids outside playing when there's really <laughs> like 30 minutes of sunlight the whole day. Um, Do you have a yeah, favorite yeah. stop in particular out of all those? Uh, Tel Aviv was, was pretty nice. You know, it's pretty similar to the States. And we were two minutes from the beach. So that was great. You know, and the weather, you know. In the winters, it's 70 degrees and people are looking at you crazy for wearing shorts. But, you know, <laughs> little, little they know it's negative 70 back in Minneapolis. So it's, uh, it's a piece of it's nothing. Exactly. Can you uh, get into your time in Russia a little more? Because that was actually one of the questions I had written down originally, because I talked to Robbie Hummel a while back and he uh, he works for BTN now. and He hated Russia. And it's interesting you point that out as, like, as, as an example of one you might not have liked as much either. So, so what is it about there besides the... Uh, you know, the seasonal, uh, <laughs> the climate and the, the, the daylight. What, what is it about there that makes Americans, I guess, uh, have an unpleasant well, it's time? Funny. It's funny. Me and Robbie actually had a few conversations throughout the year because we both were, you know, having our ups and downs living there. So it's funny that you brought his name up. But, uh, you know, Robbie's in, a, he's in Moscow, so in the Kempke region. So he is a little bit bigger. Well, just as big as St. Petersburg. But, you know, just it's just different. You know, it's, it's cold, dark. Uh, the food, I, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the the traveling was kind of tough, you know, because Russia is such a huge city. So, you know, even going from St. Petersburg to another, it's like, you know, we're sometimes in like four hour flights just to play our next local game. So traveling was tough. Um, you know, just the time differences, you might go to the next city over, but it might be a two hour time difference. So, you know, your body's adjusting is a little bit different. And, you know, like, so overall, like, you know, you go, nine months without seeing the sun, it's kind of, you know, <laughs> it's kind of hard to do much because you, you go to practice, it's dark, you leave practice, it's dark. So, you you know, your days are lost. Uh, but uh, overall, yeah, it's just, 
it just was probably the most challenging places. I think a lot of Americans endure, but you know, the money there is usually pretty good just because they have to make up for the, the tough conditions that it can be for some teams in Russia. But yeah, me and Robbie definitely had some conversations throughout the season <laughs> about living there. You're, you're talking like the KGB is still over your shoulder. Like you got a bug uh, in your phone right now. It's all, all right. right. <laughs> we have a lecture coming up. I don't want any more in trouble. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe back to a more pleasant experience. You, you talked about Tel Aviv. Uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv is one of the top teams in Europe generally, right? I, I imagine the level of competition was uh, was pretty good there. Yeah, they play. They're one of the top teams at uh, clubs in Europe. Um, they're the yearly, which is the top league outside the NBA for sure. And you know the competitions. It was you know high every every game. It's kind of like the big team. You know, every game you know might be playing Madrid or Barcelona or Olympiacos. You know, or, or you know it's always a big a big matchup. And it, it was fun for me. It was fun for our family. Like I said, everybody you know everybody there speaks English for the most part. Beautiful country. You know, the weather for us was, was amazing. You know, coming from Minneapolis, anything above 30 degrees in the wintertime is, is, is perfect for us. So, for but, sure. Yeah, overall, I just enjoyed our experience. The culture is laid back. Um, you know, they're big on rest and stuff like that, which is key for us players, you know, since it's such a long season. So, that's always a, that's always a plus. But, yeah, overall, I didn't have any bad experiences there at all. Well, I love talking to dudes that played overseas because the stories that come out of their experiences are, are really hysterical. Like, I mentioned Robbie was one. Stephen Bardo is another guy who has some uh, experiences. Usually there's like some instance of fans throwing things on the court or refs smoking cigarettes during the game. Do you, <laughs> do you have any like stories that jump out? You know, maybe payment was, was uh, not arriving when it was supposed to. Does anything jump out just uh, looking across your, your last six years of playing overseas? Well, for the most part, my I've been on pretty good clubs. We've been professional as far as money being on time. Um, there has been a couple teams I've dealt with, and there's actually a team, my former team last year, who owes me money, so I'm still <laughs> waiting on. But uh, yeah, my first game actually, I was, I was playing in Rome with uh, Jordan Taylor, our first game of the season, uh, and our fans got into a huge fight, and one of our fans got jumped, and then they were like throwing like uh, like flares into the air and stuff like that. And I was just look, I looked at Jordan, I was like, "Yo, what, what did you get me into?" <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, uh, "That was a pretty interesting." Uh, first experience, like seeing one of our fans get beat up by some other fans, and seeing us get like you know the security guards had like their whole like mob off or like their suits on with the bulletproof vests and the shields and everything. It's just like pretty intense. But I'm telling I, you, <laughs> I'm telling you, it never fails when uh, when I ask this. Like, there's always something that jumps to mind right away. Oh yeah, for sure. That was yeah, that was my first game. I was just like, wow, this is what Europe is like. <laughs> But the fans are great, you know. It's it's fun for the most part, you know, as long as everybody's safe playing in those type of environments. You know, they're loud, they're cheering, you know, they're fighting against each other. I feel like half the time the fans just go just to argue with the other fans and they don't really care about the game itself. It could be soccer, it could be basketball. It reminds that reminds me of a – that's like a great first impression story. That reminds me of I went to – first time I went to Philly, and within 20 minutes I was there, I saw a cab driver get in a fight with, uh, I guess, the guy that was in his car and then, like, 20 cop cars pulled up. It's just, you know, it's like a first impression. Welcome to your, your hero moment, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. I'm going to use the uh, overseas ball discussion as a transition to kind of talk about some current events here, especially with uh, the stuff and heating up about what guys like Brian Williamson should do um, when it comes to either playing college basketball or if a one and done rule is eliminated, going straight to the league. One of the alternatives that's been thrown out there is. Players, if they want to get paid right away, go to Europe for a year or two. Like Luka Doncic suggested that as an alternative. What do you think about having played over there, just knowing the, the level of competition? What would it be like if an 18-year-old kid from the U.S. – and I know it's been done before, but, but what are your thoughts on a player going over there and uh, playing for a year or two? Is it something that is uh, feasible? Uh, yes. I don't think that's the best – plan i think the you know i think what the league now is just proposed with the eliminating the one and done rule which i think that's the best plan i think if players would have the talent to go to the pros and they should be able to and then, you know if it doesn't work out then they always have the g league or the you know the plan b can be europe i think europe just first out especially at 18 it's you know it's hard for us you know i just turned 30 now and still like you know struggles sometimes you know it's a culture shock and you're away from your family so at 18 years old i couldn't imagine you know, not be able to talk to your friends and family back home and, you know, just be in temp- different time differences. But, yeah, it's um, it's fun getting paid, but, you know, it's all the other things. Like, 
find out, you know, you can't eat out every day, you know, just the, you know, learning how to grow up. And I, I think it would just be a hard route to go. And, you know, you, you have some people who, who have done well, but, you know, look at Brandon Jennings, like I, the, the team I played for my first year was a team. He signed his big contract out of high school with him. I don't think he had averaged more than six points a game his first year out and everybody, Oh, look at that. But, you know, eventually he ended up being a first round pick and he had a solid first part of his career, but this is a hard adjustment. For sure, yeah. I, I was going to use Brandon as an example because I remember him going over there and kind of disappearing and uh, vanishing on the bench. Um, how about with uh, Zion and, and you know, potentially coming back this year, if you were in his position, would you, you know, if you were healthy enough, rejoin your guys if you were on Duke and sit out? Uh, that's hard. I mean, with him, I would probably risk to now. You know, the season's almost done, and I don't think it's really worth it. To me, because you know he has so much money waiting for him, and he's gonna be the number one pick. And just how he plays, it's like it's it's incredible that he's been able to stay healthy this long. I just think about two hundred eighty-five pounds just jumping, and you know how explosive he is. It hurts my body looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, no, I mean maybe if early in the season if this happened, like December or something like that, I maybe could see why he would just like, oh, you know what, still half the season, I don't want to risk anything more. But it's kind of hard now. He's battled, and you know he went there to win the championship, and now they have a good chance to. So I think it's just a tough decision, but I would definitely support either way he went. Cause I feel like it's you know either way I could obviously see as a basketball player why he would you know do what he, the decision he did. Yeah, challenge. for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Like whatever makes him happy at this point, you know, I don't think it's really a wrong answer but uh we'll move on now to your playing career and talk about your college days in minnesota and, and uh i went to university of illinois so i gotta bring this up right off the bat oh, because man, that's don't say it don't say yeah, it I, you know what i'm getting at and, <laughs> and i'm bringing it up especially because i saw i think i follow uh this guy on instagram who posted it the other day by the name of brandon paul and uh he tagged you and and uh it was it, it was when you got dunked charge. on your senior charge. year Right, so just tell me what happened. For those who don't know what we're talking about, lay out what happened on that play uh, that he was clowning you on Instagram for. Just a couple of days ago. Uh, he caught me. It was it was back back when I came back from my ACL injury, so I wasn't really back to my shot blocking yet. So I was took charges at that point in my career, and yeah, one well, of my guards just got beat. Who I still get uh, who I still give crap to for getting me dunked on, and uh, he got beat back door or something, and I was just standing there, had no choices but to try and take a charge. But the weird thing is they called a charge but they still count on the basket so i don't really understand how that works <laughs> but but uh yeah he got me. it was probably my worst uh poster dunk that i've received ever so but yeah brandon paul every year comes up and he hits me up on instagram or something like that we maybe joke about it and then i talk about how i had 20 and 10 and we won so i got i had the last laugh <laughs> i was gonna say yeah i was at that game and i was always gonna give you the out of saying you guys ended up winning that game pretty easily so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the last exactly. laugh. but yeah like that that was his second foul, too, so it, it helped us out because he had to skip the whole first half. Man. And, yeah, you pointed it out, and I always – when I see that highlight, it makes no sense how it could be a charge and <laughs> on a dunk because it's not like he could have got the ball out of his hand in time, you know? Right, exactly. So we were all looking like, hey, how do you get two points in the, but you call offensive foul, too? So I think the refs were just kind of shocked at the time, too, because of, <laughs> of just the play itself. Play yeah, itself. Man, it was, it's fun. <laughs> It's all in good fun. And that year, uh, that was your senior year, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was a year where, when the Big Ten was just, like, so loaded. Uh, I think Indiana was number one most of that year. Michigan was loaded. Ohio State was really good. Michigan State, Wisconsin. And then those yeah, two teams we were just brutal. talking about, Illinois and Minnesota were top 25 for a good, good chunk of that year. So uh, what jumps out at you about, you know, just the level of play and, and memories from that year? Man, it was just fun. Like, I know there's a, you know, Big Ten's always solid. I think now we have, what, five, ten drinks, maybe six or something. Yeah, it's deep this year, too. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, every day, every game was a battle. You know, even you thought, like, the Penn State and those might be your, like, easier games, but those still are challenges. I think we might have got swept by Penn State that year. But, yeah, like, we were top ten for a, a, a part of the season. You know, Michigan, Michigan State, it, we beat Indiana with their number one. So, it was never – uh, easy, uh, easy week to play. You know, Ohio State at Sullinger and Deshaun Thomas and those guys, and it was just brutal. It was fun though. You know, that's why I think guys go to the Big Ten in order to play those type of teams. And you know, outside of the Big Ten, everybody looks at the conference like, oh, it's boring. You just beat up on each other. But as competitors and people actually inside it, it's fun for us. I know it's not the best sometimes when the score is twenty to fifteen at halftime, but. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, but it, it was fun though. I look back and it's always fun. Like, you know, I talked to Draymond and some of those guys still and we just like, you know, just think back like, yeah, all the battles that we all had and it, it was all it was it was it was fun and it was some of the best games I've played in my life. Yeah, it's you guys had a really competition. really deep squad, uh you know, the Austin, Andre Hollins, uh those two and Rodney Williams and those guys. And you mentioned beating Indiana your senior year. Uh is that a top moment of your your time in Minnesota or are there some others that uh jump um, out? Uh, the, that's definitely the top time, so <laughs> going against Indiana at home, seeing the, the fans rush the floor, and it was against my former head coach, so that's uh, you know it made it even sweeter. Speaking of head coaches, uh, Tubby Smith was your coach while you were there, and I always wondered this because my my roommate dug this clip up and I'd forgotten about it when Tubby is in the locker room and it was uh, Valentine's Day, and you guys had just won, and he's like, "And it's Valentine's Day!" Like, what what was that all about? Uh, I don't know. Coach Smith is tough. Sometimes we sound like a lot of good after a game. I think that was versus Wisconsin too. So, was, you know, obviously for us, it was a big win on Valentine's Day. And I think, is that the one he was dancing to Kesha? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so but yeah, I don't, I don't really remember the, if, or the ends about it, but uh, it, it was fun. I think it was just his being in the spirit because Valentine's Day and because we beat our biggest rival, <laughs> Wisconsin. So I think that had a big, a big part of it too. I think Wisconsin was probably ranked at the time too. So it was a, uh, it was a great day for us. Yeah, you could find that clip on YouTube, I'm pretty sure, still. And uh, maybe he could dance a little bit, couldn't he? Yeah, you know, he has some uh, old grandpa moves for sure. <laughs> uh, when's the last time you've been back to, uh, you know, the University of Minnesota campus and just seen the facilities and the new setup that the Gophers have? Have you uh, checked that out at all? Yeah, I was there uh, a few months ago, actually. When I was on break, I got a chance to see the facilities finally. And, you know, it made me mad. <laughs> I, don't think I was going to say. Uh, yeah, you know, because two years, I think it was, they built it the year or two years after I finally left. And, you know, Coach Smith for long is just trying to get something built. And, but the facilities are amazing. It's, it's you know, top of the art. It's, it's probably one of the nicest for sure in, in the country. And, you know, it, 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 I would have felt lucky if I was able to have some of the you know, the uh, things that they, the new guys have for sure. I don't think they realize how good they have it because, you know, we were fighting for gym time with our gymnastics team half the time at our, you know, wrestling team trying to share the court with them. And now they have their own practice uh, facility that they can use whenever 24-7. And it, I'm, I'm happy for the guys, though, for sure. It's, it's what we needed as a university to, you know, kind of compete with the other big teams in the conference and in the nation. Yeah. But it's, it's amazing. It's for sure 10 out of 10. Yeah, the whole Olympic Village setup is great, and, and like you said, compared to what you had just like you know six years ago, it's it's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> speaking of speaking of the barn and some of the update upgrades that your uh, the Gophers have made, what do you think about the floor? Like the white, bright new floor they got there. Uh, it took a little bit of time to adjust to it, but once I saw it in person, I kind of like you know it brightens it up a little bit, and it, you know it kind of modernizes the barn without like getting rid of like what the barn represents itself. So I think it was it was kind of maybe needed. It was kind it's kind of where we first saw it because the colors are kind of like off, but in person it doesn't. I'm used to it now, and I I kind of like it. It brightens up the floor, it kind of livens up the you know the air, the the environment a little bit. Yeah, because when I watch Minnesota basketball and like at the bar, and you just kind of think of like a dark older gym, and then it's totally changed the the way it's the way I watch it on TV, at least uh, <laughs> at least in my opinion. Um, yeah, exactly. And and speaking of the current Minnesota uh, Gophers, you know, setup and, and team, we're coming down the stretch here with a squad that has NCAA tournament talent that is still like most people's projections gonna get into the NCAA tournament. Uh, they're playing Rutgers right now, so that's, that's obviously a big game for them. But what are your thoughts on the current state of Minnesota basketball and, and how they've you know handled this season and, and how they progressed under Coach Patino? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've had some ups and downs this season. Um, like we had like a four or five game losing streak in the middle of the Big Ten, which is, you know, like I said, it's hard. Sometimes you get stretches when you just, you know, you get a couple tough road games in a row or just – you know, kind of can't finish our games we're supposed to win. But I think we kind of still control our destiny. Um, we're close to winning 20 games again and, you know, maybe get a, a big win or two in the Big Ten tournament to solidify our spot in the tournament. But I think Coach Patino has been doing a good job. He had a big recruiting class come in. I think they've all kind of have lived up to the hype or a little bit more. And, um, you know, you, you have big guys like Murphy and the mayor who's been around and Dupree who, 
with all the great leadership and just the level that Mir has been playing on and Jordan. You know, Jordan's going to get you 15 and 20 every in most games. It's probably the best rebounder in the country. So I think when you have those pieces as your key pieces, you you know, most times you're going to, you know, you, you can trust that you're going to at least be in the game at the end. At the end. And you just got to make the right plays to get the win. But yeah. Yeah. Has Jordan broke your uh, rebounding records yet? There, I, know, I mean, I know he set a bunch, but like as far as like rebounds uh, per game go, he he's is he above yeah, you. I think Jordan. I think he broke it after his first ten games of playing. <laughs> <laughs> Were you salty yeah. about that at all? Nah, I mean, I'm happy for it, but his level of rebound has just been it's been crazy. Like I don't think I could even do it. He's not that tall either. He's like he's like six eight, maybe you know. Maybe, I don't, yeah, I don't know if he's six eight. Maybe with shoes on, probably six seven and a half, six eight. But you know, his hair. older is just yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the hair. <laughs> but uh, nah, he's he's been a remarkable. The records he's doing, and you know, I think he's a big ten, big ten's all time leader rebound. I believe now, so I think that's just something that's always gonna be cool to be able to tell his kids and grandkids and you know everybody that what he did in a big conference like that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. He puts up like NBA numbers in in forty minutes. So you know, look at the stat lines like twenty. 20- points 22 rebounds it's mind-boggling yeah. college player yeah. um one last question before i let you go how do you how do you consume these gopher games when you're overseas we talked about the time difference do you get to check out many games um japan's tough uh japan's a little bit easier because like right now i'm waking up and it's halftime at the game so i'll be able to catch the rest of the game but for, for oh, it's easier on weekends you know if we don't have a game or anything i can stay up a little bit later or wake up a little bit earlier watch the games but uh but so far in Japan, that's probably the easiest thing because I can watch sporting events in the morning rather than like in Europe. I have to wait until like two o'clock in the morning in order if I want to watch a game. So that's probably one of the pros of being, you know, with the time difference the way it is now. But uh, I, de- I definitely, as far as the big games, are for sure I, I, I make the best effort I can to, to watch those games when I do get a chance. All right. Well, I will let you go, Trevor. And uh, I know you want to watch the second half of this Minnesota Rutgers game. And I appreciate you giving some of your time on a Monday morning. And I uh, appreciate you making this happen, and we'll continue to follow your career uh, the rest of the way. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Alex. All right, thanks once again to Trevor for joining me. Really appreciate his time, especially calling from uh, many thousands of miles away over in Japan. Definitely cool to hear about his experiences and uh, his path and journey after he tore it up in the Big Ten for a number of years. So thanks again, Trevor. And all right, like I said at the top of the show, we will kick it over now to our producer slash, I guess, kind of co-host now, Colleen Degnan, who catches us up in the world of sports, pop culture, and entertainment. Fun as always. It's our Call for the Culture segment with Colleen Degnan, and it starts right now. All right, we're back with another Call for the Culture segment. I mistakenly said last week that it was our third edition of this, and it was actually our fourth. So I already shortchanged this, Colleen. I'm sorry about that. This is number five. It just it just already feels like such a routine, I guess. Yeah, and you tried to correct me, but I didn't pick up on your nonverbal cues. So we're on number five. Um, sorry about that. And leading into this week's episode, um, I know we kind of set the table last week talking about the rematch of our alma maters, Wisconsin and Illinois. They played Monday night. And... Uh, to the surprise, pretty much of no one, even though Illinois has been playing better, Wisconsin won because that's all they've done in this series lately is beat <laughs> Illinois. So. so we just so making sure everybody knows that's now 15 consecutive wins over Illinois basketball. So. Yeah, yeah, 15 consecutive. Um, congrats to, to your alma mater. I mean, it's not that big of a congratulations. It wasn't the prettiest of games. It wasn't. It wasn't. What's more mind-blowing to me is that not only have they beaten Illinois 15 times in a row in basketball, you throw in nine football games in a row. That's 24 straight times dating back to 2007 stat. in football, 2011 in basketball. I I don't know if we could find another um, two schools that have a football and basketball drought like Illinois has against Wisconsin. It, I, it, it's crazy. What's interesting is that I was kind of scrolling Twitter through uh, out that game, and I have a lot of uh, people from the University of Illinois that I follow because I went there, and it's funny to me how many – Illini fans do not like Wisconsin. They were they were really yeah, getting they, a little chippy yeah, with they, us. They were just saying, "Oh, I saw a lot of I hate Wisconsin. I can't stand losing to them." 
Why do you think that is? is it just because of the domination so far, or what do you think? I guess. I mean, I never really pictured Illinois as a rival when well, I, was, when I that, went there. That's what's interesting, though, because I don't think, yeah, I don't think Wisconsin and Illinois are necessarily rivals either, even though they're on, you know, bordering states and all that. But Andy Katz, we have him do a weekly digital segment where he lists five of his favorite things in, in any particular category. And this week was five future rivalries, or not even future rivalries, like just rivalries, rivalries to look out for in the future. So it could be like ones that already existed, like Indiana, Purdue, Michigan, Michigan State. But one of them was Wisconsin, Illinois. I think your thoughts. I kind of love that because I do feel like there's a huge conglomeracy of Wisconsin alumni that now live in Chicago, and so it's like very fun because obviously there's a ton of fighting Illini here too and as Andy pointed out they've had great games over the years even though it's been the last like eight or nine years have been dominated by um, Wisconsin it, in the mid 2000s Illinois was one of the only teams that could win at Cole Center when when it was pretty much impossible to win there and you go back even further um, the rivalry has been pretty good it's not a natural one but I can kind of see where Andy's coming from there yeah I mean also a ton of the students from Chicago suburbs end up in Madison so yeah. I like it. I could see it. Not 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 necessarily a heated rivalry, although, like I said on Twitter, the a lot of nation may feel otherwise. I think that's just because they've lost so many times; they're sick of it. But um, yeah, it's something to keep an eye on. And like I said, I don't think Wisconsin's going anywhere in basketball anytime soon. They're they're solid, and I mean, I think Illinois is on the upswing for sure. Um, nobody was really disappointed after. I mean, they're disappointed, but nobody was like taking it out of a larger context and, and applying it to any sort of doom and gloom. So for everyone listening, Alex did not make it into work on Tuesday after the loss. Yeah, yeah and that's... Uh, so he did not for, want to show his face. For completely different reasons, actually. I uh, was a little under the weather, still am, so I apologize for I my voice not coming through uh, necessarily all that well, but I'm playing injured, playing hurt, you know, podcasters, we gotta <laughs> tough it out. And um, you know, I did it for the fans. You know, I'm I'm playing dedication, right now. dedication. Exactly. So while I was uh, you know battling this over the weekend and a little bit into the week, I think you were having a good time. Judging by Instagram, what were you, what were you <laughs> up to? Judging by Instagram, yeah, me and some of my girlfriends from college had a little gals trip down to Nashville. One of our best friends lives down there, so it was quite a time. Got to celebrate. Uh, an engagement party for nice. one of our other friends. Okay. And while we were there, obviously, was the NBA All-Star weekend happening. Yeah, I mean, mid-February is a good time to go to Nash Vegas, you know, hopefully get a little bit of better weather. And right now, the only thing that's really going on in sports, big event-wise, is the NBA All-Star game, like you said. So, do you have your... Did you have your eyes on that? I so, since you brought it up, I assume you did. So on Sunday, we're all hanging out at the at the house, chilling, just watching movies, and the time for the All Star game approaches, and I I just pop up from my seat. I'm like, guys, like, can we like throw on the game for a mm-hmm. little bit? They all look at me. and They're like, oh, Bucky's playing tonight. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like it's it, like Dame's playing though. So then my one friend who listens is like, oh, the, the Trailblazers are playing. I was like, oh no, it's it's the All Star game. I kid you not, Alex, majority of my friends looked at me as if I asked them to watch grass grow in a live stream. And it got shut down so hard. So you didn't get to put it on? Oh, so I was streaming it on my phone, okay. obviously, and following along on Twitter because Dame had a great second half. He did. And LeBron's team came back, which I'm not usually on LeBron's side, but for this, obviously, I wanted to see. So you were watching oh, solo yeah. then. Nobody was able to get on board with your uh, viewing habits or something like that? <laughs> Apparently, I got outvoted, but they support me. But um, actually, we had uh, one of the Oscar-nominated movies going on instead. Okay, so. well, you probably watch more of the All-Star game than I did, because I, I found myself in the last handful of years, you know, kind of tuning in at the beginning to see the intros and all that, and then watching maybe the last 10 minutes, which is what I did again this year. So, didn't watch a whole lot of the All-Star game. I know Dame Lillard, you know, made you guys proud, uh, all you Trailblazers proud. fans, but I did watch... A uh, decent amount of the All Star Saturday night with the three point contest and the dunk contest going on. I don't know if you got a chance to see any of that. I, elaborate. Why? What? What are your thoughts? Well, I don't know. I think with the dunk contest in particular, like the, the Saturday night again is a chance for pretty much all the celebs and players to kind of mingle, and it's a big event. Not so much for the competition, but for brands, for again celebrities, for performers to uh, all kind of get together. It's kind of the Super Bowl weekend in the NBA. So watching uh, the dunk contest every year, it seems like the theme, unless there's an out-of-the-ordinary great performance, is that the dunk contest is kind of broken. And I don't think that's 
necessarily by by fault of the, the participants. Like, there's only so many dunks right. out there. You can only you get can so do. creative. Right, exactly. By the so, laws of physics, even. Exactly. So our guy, Miles Bridges, our Big Ten rep, uh, he dropped out after the first round because his one of his dunks missed. And, um, yeah, it, it was decent. Like, there were a couple of good dunks. Hamadou Diallo of the Thunder ended up winning. But overall... Um, I think the only way to really fix the dunk contest to get people back interested is to get the stars back involved. And it used to be, look back in the day, like Dominique Wilkins, Michael Jordan, Vince Carter, big-time stars participating in the dunk contest. And now it's a lot of younger guys that are trying to make a name for themselves that are also super bouncy. So that kind of leads into a a topic I definitely want to get to. I think next year the dunk contest will be a must-see event because... I assume Zion Williamson's going to be in it. The, the <laughs> future he can, potential. He can keep his shoes on. Yeah, future potential number one pick. Um, but yeah, I just think getting getting stars in it is what will bring it back. Because like even when like Dwight Howard was in it. Yeah, well, it I mean, draw. the hype value in general. If you want to touch on the fact that Zion Williamson hopefully will be in it is insane. Just looking at the the game, the UNC versus Duke game. Yeah, exactly. This week, the hype gone into that was ridiculous. I know. And before I even hop on that hype train, I want to bring up. In fact, the All-Star Game is in Chicago <laughs> next year. It's coming, to our ba- it's coming to our backyard. <laughs> Hopefully, it will be Zion Williamson's hometown arena next year. Hopefully, he's a, a Chicago Bull. Uh, lofty the, dreams, the, Yeah, the Bulls, lofty dreams. Bulls pick him. But with the All-Star Game being in Chicago next year, we're going to have to like get involved somehow. We're going to have to do like a live show. They're going to hear about us by then. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm looking forward to, uh, to that coming next year. And actually, I do want to talk, like I said, about Zion, but... You had um, one more point on the All Star Game, kind of with your boy Damian Lillard and oh. his. So his devout loyalty to the Trailblazers and the city of Portland is inspiring. Yeah, and I'm so into it. And it's, he's been very upfront with not being a sellout and not getting involved in these super teams and very respectable, even in an unbiased opinion. I think that is a really cool groove right. they have going on there and the continuity continuity from past seasons is living through. But he's recently been starring in the Hulu ads for Hulu Web Sports. Okay. And kind of how I came out of the Super Bowl wanting to highlight some of those agencies, I just have been loving these ads. So I did very minimal background research. But so shout out to the agency, Big Family Table. They're a part of the Interpublic group. But they were representing Hulu and they had these hilarious ads where Dame Lillard is like getting a new tattoo and it says like Hulu has live sports and the, his agent quote unquote is there talking with the tattoo artist like oh well can we make it more creative can we do this and it's like nope not in the contract nope like have to check with the team XYZ but bottom line I, th- I think I've seen one of those commercials and he basically just keeps repeating Hulu has live sports right? yeah and it's great and Which, it's, it's like more money it's it's very they're making a very satirical play on everything well, that's going it's on it's interesting right tie in because like <laughs> That's the thing about sports fans is when you talk about this whole cable bubble bursting and something that affects you know us as a, as a sports network and how fans want to consume you know and have access to sports. You don't need a big ad campaign to draw fans in to to sign up to watch sports. They just want their game. They right? want to see their team. Exactly. So that's all it need. That's all I need. Like live sports is is not going to ever be consumed on delay. It's never going to be consumed, Absolutely. you know, if there's no on-demand version of it. So it's it's a, it's, it's a intelligent ad campaign, and the fact they're able to, you know, get Dame on board to convey that message that, hey, this is it, we have live sports, you can find it here, we have the NBA, I assume, since Dame's part of it, it's smart. Yeah, so. no, and creative and good, so yeah, definitely just wanted to, to give them some love. Absolutely. So, all right, we are talking about Zion. Oh my gosh. And this is being recorded the day after his shoe exploded at Cameron Indoor Stadium in the North Carolina Duke game. Um, first 33 of all, seconds into the game. Yeah, I don't know. Are you are you a Nike person? Do you wear Nikes? I do wear Nikes. Me too. I don't think they care that I busted my shoes. I don't see any press releases, stock dropping. It will be interesting to see, though, like once he signs a shoe deal and once he's out of Duke, like if he has any sort of hesitation now if like this is like a total fluke or like if he's I mean, had trouble with Nike before you th- I don't think he'll sign with anybody else Nike now he gets to expect an even bigger contract with them 
Yeah, maybe he could he could use it as leverage, but like I, it's such a perfect marketing tool for like Adidas, any Puma, other shoe brand, Under Armour. Yeah, now that to say like it, they were even bount, uh, pouncing on it last night. Puma tweeted, "Wouldn't have happened in Pumas or something like that," which is you know that's a little borderline just because he didn't know if the guy was hurt for a long time, but um, it was definitely interesting. And that game was such an event. I don't know. Did you watch? Yes. Anything? Well, it was one of those really hyped up events that you knew. Some It was like a New Year's Eve where you put all this hype into it uh-huh. and everybody's balling out, buying these expensive tickets. <laughs> the stars are showing up like President Obama was there. Mm-hmm. And then 33 seconds into the game, everything you thought was going to happen didn't happen. That is a good analogy for New Year's Eve. Because like New Year's Eve itself kind of sucks. Like, it, you, just have to, <laughs> yes. you just have to plan for it. But... Yeah, and the game wasn't even close. Like after Zion went out, Duke just didn't seem to have the juice at all. So, which is also mind blowing, and it's, it's yeah, gonna... considering the fact they have plenty of other good players. At yeah. Duke, so. um, yeah, and you mentioned Obama being there. I liked the fact that he had a personalized like bomber jacket. Yeah. I don't know if you saw this. <laughs> the O bomber. I think they've been the branding O-bomber it with the forty four on it. So yeah, it's definitely a a big deal. There were other celebs there. Um, big deals were made about the ticket prices being Super Bowl multiple, status, f- multiple thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah. It was and then to see him go down, what? So much pressure for him, though. Like, what? He's eighteen years old. He's eighteen years old. You know, big time Instagram star before this. Like, he he has a big profile coming in. Now he's pretty much going to be the consensus number one pick in the NBA draft. So yeah, it's you know it's a fishbowl that you have to live in, and, and we'll see now how he decides to approach the rest of his uh, college career if he if he decides to sit it out. Or play. So um, we'll move on from college basketball talk, especially outside the Big Ten. It's just, you know, Zion's so big that kind of had to had to touch on that and, and get a little more into the pop culture side of things with uh, some other events coming up this weekend. February is kind of a weird time with, uh, with sports. There, there's not a ton going on. But as we've talked about repeatedly, it's a huge month in the entertainment world. So we talked about the Grammys a couple weeks ago. Now we have um, another award show coming up. We've got the Oscars this weekend. So it's finally our award show. uh, Is this the last one? Yeah. The season ends. The season ends. Just in time for March Madness. The grand finale. Perfect. Um, But yeah, so have you, you, can you name any of the best pictures nominated? Well, I can because I saw Vice. Okay. And I saw Black Klansman. I know those two oh, are nominated. Those are. So. Great. And I round us out a little bit because I've only seen and Bohemian I've, Rhapsody and A Star is Born. And I've seen A Star is Born, too. But I've actually seen A Star is Born se- 17 times maybe at this point. So does that count for more? How many times have you actually seen it? I, like, my roommate purchased it. So, like, okay. we casually have it on in the background when whenever we play Oh, so it's like a it's like an actual it's it's not like you sit down to watch it. We we do time. we oh, do yeah, okay. And that is what um, took the status over watching the All Star Game in Nashville with the gals. So okay, so why do you need to watch it so many times? I, it's Out of curiosity. a great Jack and Allie, Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. Yeah, I've seen it. It's a good it's a decent story. Um, wow, you sound so I mean, it underwhelmed. Was a, it, was, it was fine. Like I I liked it. It was a good. Good movie. When she belts shallow for the first time in the the yeah, parking lot I, of the supermarket. Well, on, on the Grammys, they promoted that song like a million times, so I feel like that song's still stuck in my head. Okay, unimpressed, Alex. All right, understood. Let's get to some of those other ones. I have not seen Bohemian Rhapsody. I'm pulling up the list right now in front of me. Black Panther, which I've heard very good things about, and I have not seen for some reason. I want to see it. Uh, favorite with a O U R spelled O U R, so that's how you know it's serious and a big deal. So, in, yeah, in, that in screams European, Oscar winning. Foreign. Uh, Green Book, have not seen that. Roma, um, the Netflix one. I've, yeah, and I like watched the preview, and it was in black and white, and I just clicked to the next thing, so I didn't watch that. Um, and like we mentioned, Stars Born, Vice, and Black Klansman. I recommend Black Klansman. That's a good one. I w- I would like to see them all. There's just a lot of different things coming at me all the time. The thing about the Oscars for me is like, I, I don't know. I feel like there are a lot of movies, like we just mentioned, that. I just haven't gotten around to seeing, or like, haven't even hasn't even like jumped out to me as something that I would want to see. And I don't know why that is. But totally, I mean, looking at some of the past winners, how many times have you gone back to watch any of the past best picture movies in well, the in last year? Well, all right, I'll read some of the past winners to see if you've seen them or are familiar. Have you seen 2018's The Shape of Water? Yes, I did. How was that? Uh, interesting. That was, the, that was like the mermaid one, right? It was very, very it. interesting. I haven't seen that one. Uh, I Moon- watched it on a flight, though, so. Moonlight, 2017. I didn't. But that wasn't uh, that the year when they announced the wrong movie, that one? Uh, yeah, I think so. That so rings like, a bell. Yeah. I remember watching it in my first Chicago apartment, and that was Because I thought they announced ago. that La La Land one, and then it didn't. 
but I had seen La La Land. And Steve Harvey did. Um, <laughs> so I'm not. That's what I want to see too. Spotlight. Yes, so good. Spotlight. I did see. Um, I, I think I kept it. like falling asleep for some reason. What? No, I saw it on DVD and I was on a couch. And it was very good. In and, the and realm it, of journalism, you can't very, fall asleep in a, a movie like that. It's a very important, essential movie. And it's a Tom Hanks one. I watched on the wrong night because I couldn't stay awake. So. You need to go back and rewatch that. Cue it up. All right. Birdman. Absolutely not. Birdman, I only think of like as the, uh, the rapper. That just seems like scary. Lil Wayne's uh, Lil Wayne Birdman, you know? You know Birdman? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So. yeah. But no, I haven't seen okay, this. Okay, yeah, me either. And then 12 Years a Slave, which I did see, was very good. There, okay. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. But again, so I'm two for five. Again, like we could, good mix, good mix. I don't know if I'm missing out or if like the best picture is just not in my wheelhouse. I know it, it, it's a little bit more outside of our realm. You didn't see Vice? I didn't. I didn't get around to seeing it. I recommend Vice, although Vice is strange because um, it's the one about Dick Cheney, right? And kind of everything surrounding him. It's weird because it's something that was viewed a, like when you're viewing it. It's like a, um, you know, a tale about history, but it's a history that we're still kind of living right now because the consequences of what happens in the movie are still playing out. So it's kind of like you're trying to, I guess, play both sides of of, uh, how you feel about the movie because it's not like you can look back and and say, oh, that's how that ended, you know? True. That was an interesting movie. I, I enjoyed it to a certain degree. I don't know if it'll win Best Picture, but Christian Bale on that. He never ceases right. to uh, adapt to a role. I mean, that's nuts because he put on the weight that he is in that movie, right? And that's not like a fat suit. No, that's real. He like gets all into it. I don't know if like all of it is real, but Christian Bale is known obviously Batman. for well, yeah, but for being either what do they call it? like immersing yourself in the role? Like uh, he he'll go to extreme lengths. Like there was the one movie where he got down to like 115 pounds or something. Like oh super, wow. Super skinny, and then he got big for American Hustle. Did well, you see American Hustle? No. Jennifer Lawrence? No. No. Okay, well, he got big but in that one and this one. This so. sounds like a lot of commitment that he has, which um, other people in Hollywood are maybe struggling with that we must talk about. Star is born, right? Well, <laughs> That's your star. <laughs> no, the fact that Tristan Thompson. Well, he's not in Hollywood. Okay, no, he's out. Chloe well, he, is, though. That's right, okay. And he has very much been around the block in Hollywood. Breaking news this week. Yeah, Chloe Kardashian. See, even even I'm tied in. I'm not like into the Kardashian uh, drama, but well, even, we we kind of are. We we talked have about be. the egg. And That's true. So, so I have to be if you know if it's a basketball player involved, I'll probably hear about it. Have you heard the the latest? Yeah, yeah. He's he's uh, he's been less than uh, less than stellar. Less than stellar. Fiance slash husband. That's a nice nuanced way to say that. And then now. Uh, was like caught with the friend with the best friend of, of Kylie. Kylie. So honestly, like I'm not surprised. Like these circles are so small in Hollywood, and like Tristan Thompson uh, was known as like a dog before. So this doesn't surprise me at all. The Lady Gaga thing kind of does though, because she kind of had her. What, and this what? is like not confirmed, right? I don't know. No, this is not confirmed at but, all. But, but isn't, she's breaking up with her fiance. Oh, and well, then, that and is talking true. about Bradley Cooper. Right? Well, yes, but like that is not a confirmed. A lot of Allie and Jack fans might be advocates of that, but it's not confirmed. Oh, so it's not okay. Well, that's just an allegation. That's <laughs> yeah. Fair. But again, like, wasn't isn't Lady Gaga's fiance soon to be ex or whatever, like a non-famous person, not a star? Correct. Okay. So I thought she was all down to earth, but you know she is. She could still be down. Bradley, to earth. Bradley Cooper swoops in. That's Hard because they no. fell in love in the movie. I know. Real life That's romance. Why that chemistry came across so well on screen. It exactly. Was. All right. Well. So we'll see on that. We're gonna have to wrap it up soon because I'm sick and I'm my <laughs> voice is getting weaker. I can feel it getting weaker. You as need we, some tea as we go along. But uh, before we do, I just want to congratulate ourselves, pat us on the back, because we're almost through February at this point. Um, we're getting to the last week. Which means winter's almost over. Which means this nasty slushy month is almost over. More importantly, means what? March Madness. Yes, is coming. Thank you, thank you. We're close to March Madness. It's weird because this time last year, the last week of February, we were going to New York for the Big Ten tournament, and like we we're already starting March Madness essentially. This year we have to wait two more weeks. Um, the Big Ten tournament doesn't start until March thirteenth, but the good news, as we've said, is in Chicago. So we'll have to talk about some. Uh, maybe some Chicago advice for the teams and maybe the fans coming in. And maybe some... Some, some things to do for, for when they're in town. Some uh, B-Y- B1G bold predictions. For yeah, us. predictions, tourist advice, <laughs> everything. Where to eat, yeah. Yeah, all that good stuff. Um, Weather. Coming up. So good for us. We're almost through winter. 
I'm excited. March is like one of my favorite months. Really? Year. It's amazing. You love St. Patrick's Day or what? Not that. It's just like all of it. Like the weather's getting warmer. Basketball is crazy. It, it's just a little taste of summer, you know? Wow, you're really usually not the more optimistic one, and so I'm really happy that you have this take. The light at the end of the tunnel is here. Like, Big Ten wow. basketball season is great, but it can, you know, get to be a grind just with the cold weather, the long nights. Clearly, it's taking light, a toll on you. Yeah, it, I, it's, it's making me ill, like, physically, so light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there. Let's get to March, and uh, we'll keep the episodes coming for all the fans that, uh, you know, our rapidly growing fan base that we've built. So. <laughs> <laughs> the culture will not be stopped. All right, episode five, Call for the Culture is in the books. Colleen, thank you very much. Drink some tea. Any final words? Get better. All right, I'll try. <laughs> I'll see you next week. All right, shout out one last time to Colleen and Trevor for making this episode and helping me pull it together. Really appreciate it. Uh, coming down the home stretch in college basketball season now, so in future episodes as uh, – Get into March Madness. We'll have some more basketball analysis and insight. We'll get Harold Shelton back on. We will bring in some uh, other experts as well. And um, we'll try and talk to some people at the Big Ten Tournament. It's coming up in a couple weeks. So exciting times ahead. I uh, appreciate everyone listening. I appreciate my producers as always, Wes White and Julie Bronder. So stay tuned. Got a lot of good stuff coming. And once again, thanks for listening. Talk to you next time here on the Take Ten Podcast.